I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. It's already been a heavy 11th hour. And you know, I thought about it this morning. I find myself sitting behind this table more than I do standing now. I don't know why that is, but it is what it is. <laughs> Hallelujah. But <clears throat> anyway, it's already been a heavy 11th hour today. Things have, have already, you know, been heavy. You know, I want to talk to you something about, you know, tomorrow, um, I was thinking about that, tomorrow, in your tomorrow, tomorrow is an interesting subject. Tomorrow is a unique place. It is a place of mystics uh, because a place that seems so mysterious it's a place uh, of mystery because tomorrow contains a power untapped by most believers. There are three points to your life, past, present, and future. The past, what is a memory? If you could go back there right now, if you could go back right now to your past, you wouldn't be able to touch it, even if you could see it. All you would actually see is a hologram. You would just see a hologram. It's a, it's a hologram of what was. And if you tried to touch it, you would just pass through that. So it's just a, a picture, a hologram of what was, a shadow of what was. The present is very fleeting. Because like the present is right this second. But now you heard me say right this second. I'll say it again, second and now second is already in the past. It's not present any longer. It's that fast. So the present becomes a time when you decide whether you're going to live in your future or your past. It's a place of decision constantly. I want to tell you something that's kind of heavy. Did you know that today writes its own history? It's, <laughs> that's really something. You know, it's really not tomorrow that writes history, even think of it this way. How? Because when you get to tomorrow, it's today. When you wake up in the morning, it'll be today. So in that sense, therefore, when you speak of yesterday, it's always today you're doing it in. So in that sense, today records its own history. Tomorrow is like a reserved Unique place for God's people to thrive. Tomorrow, it's a place to draw strength from. When you breathe in tomorrow, it contains the air of your destiny. Your tomorrow contains the air. When you breathe in tomorrow, you're breathing in the air of your destiny. Hallelujah. It's a place where no sin exists. You're breathing 100% clean air. For there's nothing wrong in your tomorrow because you haven't gotten there yet. It's a place of hope. Hope is future. Hope is always future. The Bible teaches that now faith is, faith reaches into the realm of your destiny and pulls your future back into today and lets you live in your tomorrow today. Therefore, faith is now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right now, people are looking hard toward the future. Have you not noticed that everyone seems to be speaking about the future? Klaus Schwab, the head of the WEF, says we're not going through multiple crises, but we're going through transformation. Speaking of the future. Noah Harari, his prophet, is talking about making a type of cyborg in your tomorrow. They actually discussed this. The world just introduced chat GPT to the public. The first real intimate interaction with the everyday human and an AI. And the people are going nuts over it. The WEF have given their approval to write a new AI Bible to bond a new global religion together. You can count on it. If they have their way, people will line up to get it. And there will be bumper stickers like the coexist that speak of this new Bible. 
as they say, the correct translation, the real Bible. They have their way, the chips they're speaking about now, and the neural links embedded into people's body will no doubt be linked to hear the voice of a false god. The AI they are linked to will speak from this Bible. The whole system is being set up now. Prophets have a unique role in the five-fold ministry. Now, this is where I wanted to get to today. Prophets have a unique role in the five-fold ministry. Let's look at some things in the mantle of a prophet. A prophet is an officer of the court of heaven to bring the court of Jehovah into the earth in order for God to try rogue kings and high political figures. You know, I'll say it again. We tell the story of Nathan and David. When David had taken Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and he had Uriah killed with an enemy sword. He had Joab, he even had Uriah take his own death warrant back and present it to the general Joab, to General Joab and say, and when Joab unrolled it, Uriah standing there at attention, an honorable man, that David couldn't get him to go home to sleep with his wife because he, so he could say that the child that he had impregnated Bathsheba with was Uriah's. Uriah said, I'm not going home and enjoying my wife when all the king's army is out sleeping on the ground. So then the king, he got drunk. He got him drunk. And he, instead of going home to his wife, he slept on the steps of the king. And so the king sent, wrote out his death warrant and put in there, when you're in the heat of the battle, have Uriah put on the front. And then back away from him. Have the army back away so that he's surely killed. And when he did this, he, Joab, General Joab sent back to David the news. Said, we, we were at the wall of the city and they shot from the wall. And, and, and this, this happened, this happened. David was angry and said, did you not know they would shoot from the wall? And he said, if he's angry with you when you give him this message, tell him your servant Uriah is dead also. And so he told him, your servant Uriah is dead also. And David said, well, the sword devours one as the other. And then right after that, he took Uriah's wife as his own. And so she's pregnant. And everything looks fine, except the mighty man is dead. One of his mighty men has died. So Nathan comes in, the prophet, because the king is as high as you can go. You need to remember that. The king in this earth, the king, the president, the prime minister, whoever that may be, that's as high as you can go. Dictators that run nations, it's as high as you, a man can get to. You can't appeal to any higher. And if it's corrupt all the way to that point, then a man has no choice but to appeal to heaven. And so the blood of Uriah was crying to the Lord from the ground. And it went into the heavens. And so a prophet, an officer of the court of heaven was sent into the earth to try the king. So he walks into the king's court because prophets always have access to kings. It's not pastors that do. It's not priests that actually do. It's the part of the five-fold ministry known as prophets. They were the ones who anointed kings. They were the ones who put kings up. They were put kings down. It's always the word of a prophet that does that. Now, this is a very heavy broadcast today. I want you to really listen to me today and listen to what's being said. And so Nathan the prophet walks into the court of David, and he looks at David, and he says, There are two men in your kingdom, O king. He said, uh, One of them was very rich, had many flocks, many herds. But one in your kingdom is a very poor man, and all he has was a one little ewe lamb. He had this one little ewe lamb, and he loved this ewe lamb as his child. And he would come to the table and eat with him. It was a precious thing between the man and that little lamb. 
He just loved that little lamb. But the rich man who had many lambs and many flocks and many herds had a guest come in to stay with him. But when the guest came in to stay with him, he needed to feed him. But instead of taking one of his many lambs or his many flocks or herd, he went to the poor man in your kingdom and took the one little precious ewe lamb and he butchered that lamb and fed his guest with it. Had no thought, see, to the man. And David understood that because David was a shepherd. David was infuriated. Who is the man? Said he will have to pay back fourfold of everything. The man should die. And all of this, David was, he was hot about that. And the prophet had to do something in risk of his own life. Because you got to remember, one man had already died to cover that up. And the prophet had to turn around and point his finger at David. And he said, thou art the man. And at that moment, I'm sure it was running through Nathan's mind. Will I die today? Because we have no record that anyone else knew it. The blood had called into heaven and the prophet was sent. But David looked and had a choice to make at that moment. And David, being a man after God's own heart, it dawned on him everything he had done. And he began to cry and repent. And he said to the Lord, Lord, before you and you only have I sinned. It was that personal to David. He knew in his heart what he had done. Well, David was spared. And thus it reveals the role between a prophet and a king. You know, there was one young prophet went to a king in the Old Testament and went up to a king. People said, well, what is the difference in a prophet in the Old Testament and a prophet in the New Testament? Grace. Grace. That's the only difference. Their roles are the same. But grace is the difference. Jesus hadn't went to the cross in the Old Testament. He already has now. So grace is given. But still the prophet hears. And still the prophet proclaims, as you can find in the book of Acts. There, was, there were more than one prophet. There were prophets that came to talk to the apostle Paul. One became very well known for his accuracy in predicting what was coming in the future. His name was Agabus. It's mentioned twice in that kind of predictions. And both of them were true. So the role of the prophets hasn't changed. Grace extends the time. And grace can change things. Isaiah stepped between the Old Testament and the New Testament when he talked to Hezekiah. He said, get your house in order. Today you'll surely die. But then after that, he turns around and goes back. And the Lord said he's got 15 more years because he repented. So Isaiah drew on the grace of the future. And so the only difference in the prophets and the role of a prophet is grace. So you see how Nathan stood and it reveals the, the, the relationship between the prophet and a king or the prophet and a president, or the prophet and any high politician. Sometimes between the prophet and a member of the body of Christ. But it's always to save a life or preserve a life. One young prophet in the Old Testament, I was telling you, he went to tell the king a word. And when he gave the king the word, the king stretched his hand out, not like David, to repent. But every time a prophet gives a word to a king or a high official, a prophet has to weigh within themselves, are they going to come to kill me? Are they going to uh, repent? Or what's going to happen next? And so the prophet, because you enrage a, a king, but you're on a mission from the king, and there is no backing up from that. And so this young prophet in the Old Testament, when told one king, he said, gave him the word of the Lord and told him what was going to happen, and it wasn't a good outcome and for that king. And that king looked and pointed his finger and said, take him. And when he responded that way, his hand withered on his arm. 
he asked the prophet, pray for me that my hand be restored. And restoration was given. So he prayed for restoration and he got it. So it's not always just this is the way it is. It is over. But now it is sometimes. In the book of Daniel when Belshazzar took the cups and the gold cups and, and celebrated the gods of gold and silver using the cups of Jehovah from the temple in Jerusalem. There appeared a hand writing on the wall. Many, many tekel you farsum. You have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Tonight your kingdom will be given to you and you'll die. There was no reprieve. There was no Nobody, notice Belshazzar didn't even ask for redemption. He never even asked. And it happened exactly the way Daniel said it would happen. So a prophet is an officer of the court of heaven to bring the court of Jehovah into the earth in order for God to try rogue kings and high political officials Right now, governments and government leaders are being tried in the court of Jehovah. I need you to hear that. Right now, all over the world, governments and government leaders are being tried in the court of Yahweh as to what their end-time role concerning all of this and the future of humanity will be. How do I know? Because prophets are spotlighted in the earth right now. Look at how many prophets are on the earth right now. Look at how many are talking. How many just go on social media, go on YouTube, and look at the prophets that are showing up. Why are there so many prophets showing up? Every decision made is being weighed right now. Every decision concerning the Ukraine, Russia, Every decision, a decision the WEF is making, the WHO is making, every word Noah Harari is saying, every word Barack Obama is saying, every word of the governments of men is being weighed in the balance. Soon we will see if they were found wanting. That's why prophets are so bold across the land right now. Politicians should take heed right now. You are in the court of Yahweh. Have you not noticed that there are a lot of prophets suddenly spotlighted in the earth right now? All of them saying, thus saith the Lord. It is because you are being weighed right now. Joe Biden and the Democratic Party, you are being weighed right now. The Republican Party, you are being weighed right now. You are in trouble, very much so. The Lord spoke to me a while back and said, you and me both know that the Democrat Party's evil. Now, when the Lord says you're evil, you're evil. He said, I'm not holding the Democrat Party responsible for this mess. Now, that's a surprise, but that's what he said to me. He said, I'm holding the Republican Party responsible for it. They are the ones who claim to be the guardians of the people, and they have sold out. You let them steal the elections, and yea, you even help them, and you refuse to fix it. And you are selling my people to the Antichrist at the highest bidder. Take heed, says the Lord. You are being weighed now in the balance. Christian people with large platforms who are afraid to speak out against corruption will find yourself in your balance. You are afraid of what people might say. You do not care what I might say, says the Lord. You care more, for what, care more for what I will say than what men will say, and I will protect you. Care for what men will say, and you will have to depend on them to protect you. Deliverance of a nation is wrought through the mantle of a prophet, Hosea 12, 12, and 13. It says, by a prophet Israel was delivered, and by a prophet it was, it was preserved. A prophet hears the future and the harvest that is coming into the earth and tells it. 1 Samuel 15. That was concerning Amalek. Remember, Samuel told Saul, thus saith the Lord. I remember what Amalek did 
to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. The Hebrew rendering, you could find it in the Hebrew wording. It says, I remember the deposit Amalek made into the system. So he hears the harvest that's coming, and he tells it. A prophet understands the signs of the times to know what people ought to do, not just what they will do. The sons of Issachar, this is the tribe where the prophet Elisha came from, Issachar. A prophet is the mantle which the Lord God uses to hold back the Antichrist spirit. We see that in Revelation chapter 11. A prophet brings unity. 1 Kings 18.30, when Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. It's the mantle of a prophet that brings unity. Unity. Unity is something that must happen right now. Prophets must begin to call for unity in the body. It's not just enough that we call and say the things that we're saying, but we must start to call for unity in the body. It has to be called for. It needs to happen now. It seems that others that are not prophets seek to control prophets. They seek to rid the earth of them. We are fighting the greatest foe we have ever seen before, and the infamous unity we talk about is needed for this time like never before. Instead of coming into the unity of the faith, the church constantly tries to proselyte itself throughout denominations. Let God put you in the color tent he wants you in. We wonder what's going to happen next. Prophets can help with that. <laughs> they can. Make no mistake, while the body is divided, the enemy will make his next move. While you see people in the body that are not prophets, attack prophets constantly, constantly, constantly. Make this, uh, be sure to know this. They are a distraction the enemy's using while he builds his attack. Everyone's focused on the inside, and no one's on the wall watching for the enemy that's trying to get in. And so we, we see this happening right now. And make no mistake, while you attack each other in the body, the enemy plans his next move. Right now, people are looking hard toward tomorrow. And tomorrow is what we're talking about today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now let me say this to you before I close on this today. I hope you've got a lot out of this today. Why do people fear prophets? Did you know that prophets bring a lot of fear? Does anybody know that? I mean, you know, I can't. I see a few of our team out here, and this is a closed set, so, but it's dark. I can see you all a little bit. But did you know that prophets bring fear? They bring fear. You say, oh, they, oh, no. If you're of God, you bring love. No, they bring fear. How? What am I talking about? All believe, all believe, but all are not prepared. See, all believe. You know, I'm amazed. I, I have friends that are in, in the real estate business and so forth, and, and I've noticed that over the years, you know, in different year, uh, times, I'd go to look at a piece of property or house, and they always say something like this. Well, if it's meant to be, they're acknowledging a power beyond themselves. Everybody believes, even so-called atheists, but all are not prepared. They all believe, even so-called atheists, but all are not prepared for the consequences of what is said. And so a prophet brings fear. So they fear the prophets. 
Some love the prophets. Did you know that there are actually people who, bless God, love the prophets? <laughs> Can you believe that? Wow. They love the prophets? Yes, they do. Who are they? Those who are prepared with holy living lives. They love the prophets because you are prepared. Those who love unholy fear to the point that they attack the prophets. Those who are not prepared, those who love unholy things, they're afraid so of the prophets, they attack the prophets and viciously attack them because they are not prepared. They think if they kill Elijah, so to speak, they stop the word. But this is not true. For every one Elijah, there are 7,000 more like him. Remember the Lord told Elijah in the, in the cave. He said, I've got 7,000 more Elijah like you. I've got seven. He said, I'm the only one. He said, no, I've got 7,000 more just like you that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. But they think if they can destroy the Elijah, oh, get rid of him. And, and you, no, 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 no. There's 7,000 more just like him. You will never get rid of them. When their testimony is finished, then evil is allowed. If their testimony, if their testimony was not even heard. If their testimony was not heard. See, when their testimony is finished, evil is allowed if their testimony is not heard. So, when their prophecies are finished, then evil is allowed to come if those prophecies were not heard and listened and, and adhered to or heeded to. If the prophecies are heeded to, it's amazing to me how, it's really something to me how Hezekiah repented when he received a death sentence. It's amazing to me how Saul repented like that when the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus. What's amazing to me is when the handwriting on the wall showed up, Belshazzar never repented. He never even tried. That's something to me. I don't, I mean, you would think a hand appearing and writing on the wall was it. That's enough to fall on your knees and beg, please, please, please. But he told him, no, you knew better, and you did it anyway. So there comes a time when the one more drop is like Herod, yet he added one more thing that he killed James. He took James and killed him. He added this thing. He added this thing that he cut the head off John the Baptist. He added this thing. There is a time when it's added to, to the point of running over. So today, the Lord had me do the whole program to politicians. And he can you hear him pleading? Change. If you don't, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. You are not ready to face a living God. You have portrayed yourselves as God. You have whored around and licked up the milk of sin and the bowl of sin, like you, no one can touch you. There is a living God in heaven. And you are filling the bowl of wrath daily. And the day will come when you will pour one more too much into that bowl. You take heed. Because there will be a place when you're like Belshazzar. When you reach a place where you knew better. 
and you did it anyway. Put your clothes back on. Stand up in your office. Wake up from your drunkenness of power and be the hero of the hour while there's still time. Hallelujah. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today. It's been a strong 11th hour today. It's been an 11th hour that is sobering, eye-opening. You know, I wish I had the quote of Thomas Jefferson before me. When Thomas Jefferson said, we are uh, talking about waking up the justice of Almighty God. The judgment and the justice, you don't want that. But surely, in what we're seeing today, we have the justice of God that's been sleeping. You say, has it been sleeping? It's called in grace. But imagine it, it being asleep. Why? Because there's still ten righteous. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah, there were still ten. But surely, as governments give permission to mutilate the genitals of little children, as governments give permission, and it ought to be seen, why is all the liberal entities attacking the new movie out that was about rescuing babies? Why? Why? How could that be? Surely, by doing the things we're doing and having some topless transgender on the White House lawn holding their breasts, jumping up and down, screaming that something that looks like a wild orgy going on on our White House lawn, surely we have the arm of God's sleeping justice shaking it with all of our might saying, wake up and judge us, wake up and judge us. Surely that's what we're doing. And the only reason it is not is because it's the covenant with Abraham for the ten righteous is still in play. Could America stand the judgment of God? No. Does America think they can't be judged by God? Yes. And that puts it in a dangerous position. And those that are screaming with the truth, they're trying to put a bag over their head like some kind of hit man and choke the life off of it. But there is a God in heaven. And right now, all government entities, all of every nation, every tribe, every tongue, the court of Jehovah is in the earth. Beware. People say, well, I, I, we're not being judged. Oh, but you are. We're not on trial. Oh, but you are. Right now. It's the time to call for mercy. The time to call for grace. It's the time to rise up and say, I want to be a hero in this hour. God will make you a hero. He'll make you such a hero that you'll turn around and look and your enemies will just become like a vapor behind you and disappear. And some of you will realize your destiny and end up in the highest political offices you could have ever imagined because you did the right thing. Some of you will end up in places that you'll say, Dear God, I didn't know life could be so good because you said yes to God. Hallelujah. So it's a call. First of all, the Saul of Tarsus time has come. And then what happens after that? We'll see. Amen. Well, 11th hour has been charged full of all kinds of things and um, the future, what it is, role of prophets, politicians, <laughs> all kinds of things. And now it's time we're going to receive our offering. Hallelujah. Are you doing that today? That is so good. Come on and just 
uh, take this mic, I guess. We'll just be a little informal out here. Okay. Well, thank you, Roxanne. We just passed this mic around. You can tell this is all live, can't you? I mean, we don't, you know, we don't rehearse anything usually from music to <laughs> anything else. You know, I want you to, uh, to listen to this about um, partnership. It says in Philippians chapter 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servant of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making request with joy for your fellowship, that's the word partnership, also in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to listen to verse 7 very closely. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, insomuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Now, I want you to notice that. Paul said, you're partakers of the grace of God that's on me. See, this is what happens with partnership. People come up to us wherever I go. Wherever I go, it's always someone always comes up, it seems, and says, I'm your partner. I'm your partner. Man, you know, that just thrills us. I'll just stop and look at them and think, thank you so much for being our partner. Because that means they believe in everything we're doing. They believe in, the, in, in what's in the boldness here and what's going on here and, and what the Lord has called us to do in our part in, in the destiny of, of humanity. And so Paul said, you are partakers of my grace. That means the anointing on Paul, they could expect to come on them. And that's the same way with you if you're our partner. Expect the anointing on this ministry to come on you. You should operate in the teaching anointing, the prophetic anointing, the, the, the music, everything. Whatever it is that you can partake of, of this anointing, it will come on you. And so you should expect that. You should call for that. If you're our partners, no, I don't care where you are in the world. This is not just an American thing. This is word of God thing. There are nations. There are, there are all of that. But we're from the kingdom, man. We're from the kingdom. You know, I remember a, a friend of mine who was, he's in heaven now. And uh, he's in the cloud of witnesses. So he can witness this. That he said to me, he was a, a chaplain, worked as a chaplain down in a, a Dothan prison in Alabama. And, and uh, uh, Farrakhan had sent some of his lieutenants down there to, to recruit uh, some of their Muslim crowd and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and one of them down there got born again. And uh, they kept on and kept on saying about, we're from the the nation, the nation, the nation. And my friend, I think it was my friend or one of the ones that got converted, looked at him and said, man, we're from the kingdom. We're from a kingdom. We're from the kingdom of God, not just the nation. Man, that makes a difference because all the rules of the kingdom, all the blessings of the kingdom are yours. And if you're a partner with this ministry, Call for the anointing that's on this ministry to be on you. I pray that over you every night. I pray that over our partners every night. And if you're not a partner with a ministry, you should be one. You should be a partner with someone. And if you're going to be a partner with this ministry, pray about it. And if you are, then I want you to know you can fully expect this anointing to come on you. And I'm praying over you every day. You are not ever without prayer. I carry your names with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to know the most important thing you'll ever do in your life is make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. If you've never done that, I don't care who you are or where you are, this will work because he's already paid the price for it. 
Paul said, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he is your Lord, you shall be saved. So go ahead right now and say it out loud. Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and personal Savior. From this day forward, I am a Christian. I belong to you. Hallelujah. And now say this, take my life, do something with it. I'm yours to command. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ahead and he'll cleanse you of all sin. Say, Lord, cleanse me. Wipe my sin away. I belong to you now. Hallelujah. And he will. He will. And he'll be your king and your Lord. Amen. And don't stop there. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Just say, Lord Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit tells me what to say. Now just start thanking him for it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now I'll say to you as the Apostle Paul would receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now just receive that. And start speaking in tongues. Unashamedly, let it start coming out of your mouth. Hallelujah. All creation is groaning, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed to it. Amen. Praise God. Well, until next time we gather together right here around God's word. I want you to remember. Never forget this, that God is absolutely good. Shalom, shalom.